So now that you know what sensors we are using, we're going to look at how we can control bioreactors. And in this case, I'm going to give you a particular example of how, instead of using physiological parameters, how we can use inferential control. Now, we also need to see why there's a need for this modeling. Why is it particularly important in bioreactors? And I'm going to explain the role of principal component analysis and PLS in these models. Then, then first of all, looking at what is inferential control. So the physiological control is what we can measure uh, in our reactor. We can direct, measure that directly using these in-situ sensors. So these are things like pH, temperature, speed of agitation, and we can use that directly to control processes. However, as we've seen in bioreactors, the composition is often quite complex. So what happens is not that easy to measure certain things, particular cell growth is not that straightforward. So we can't use in situ sensors for everything, particularly because you have to sterilize them every time. Um, so we've seen that you can use flow injection analysis, uh, but often if you want to do really specialized analysis, you would have to take a sample out of the reactor, you have to measure it in a lab elsewhere, and you can have like a substantial time delay, which is not ideal if you're looking at controlling the reactors. So what do we do instead? Often you use another variable to estimate something else. And to estimate is also to infer, so that's why it's called inferential control. So how does it work? Uh, this is where you see where the modeling comes in because you need some software for it. So we have the hardware, so that's the sensor that actually measures in the reactor. And then we're looking at something what is what they call the soft sensor, if you look at the boxes. So the soft sensor lo is, looks at the whole concept of it. So it looks at the hardware that actually measures something. Then it looks at the actual uh, variable that you're kind of estimating. And then you would have some kind of model um, that is used to see how a particular variable is linked to something else. So this concept of soft sciences is particularly important in bioreactors. Now, what are examples of this? Because it might not be directly kind of clear what this is. And here's a, what we're going to look at cell growth. So remember cell growth you know, we could look at taking the biomass, taking the biomass out of the reactor, or you might have to dry it, uh, which is obviously very energy consuming. We might culture it. Um, we could also look at, um, at uh, using uh, the optical density. So that was using these UV vis measurements. But there you would have to, you could sometimes have some interference of solid particles. So there are other concepts we can look at. And uh, all these variables, I will explain how they're used to estimate cell growth. So first of all, cells, when they're growing, they obviously take up oxygen. So the oxygen content will also tell you whether cells are growing or not. Then when they are growing, they're respirating. So they're uh, releasing carbon dioxide. Yeah, so carbon dioxide is another way of checking whether they're actually still reproducing. And the other thing what we have seen before is you can look at them metabolically active. So there are some molecules that particularly indicate metabolic activity. Uh, they were often measured using fluorescence, so some high expression of ATP, for instance. So all of these would be markers to indicate that the cells are growing. And there is software how you can link these two variables, so you can get around the use of in situ sensors that are maybe not available or that don't particularly work that well because they fail easily. Uh, and you can use something else which is easier to measure and then use to control another variable. But modeling in bioreactors is probably a little bit different than what you're used to. So in most other reactors, you can use an empirical approach because that's just easier to do. However, if you're working with pharmaceutical products and you have to imagine that in the end, these products are used on people, you really need to understand the principles. So it's much more important that you understand the fundamentals uh, in, in this case rather than using an empirical model. And this is because obviously thinking of the pharmaceutical sector you're looking at. So the modeling would be very different than what you're used to. Principle component analysis is the first thing we're going to look at, which is used in modeling. And what you have to understand is that it is nothing more than simply compressing data. So you're trying to compress data in such a way that you still maintain the error that you have in your signal, but that you're just using data which is not relevant. So for instance, think of for instance, photography where you have pixels and you can compress all your data or it's similar to compressing a zip file. You try to compress data in such a way that you're not actually losing the essence of the data. And the essence of the data in this case is related to the error because obviously you want the, the quality of the product to be consistent. 
However, uh, what it does do when you look at principal component analysis, it just looks at variation in the signal. It doesn't tell you how this variation in the signal is actually linked to the output of the product, because it might be that certain aspects are not really, uh, not really linked to the, the quality of the pharmaceuticals that you're looking at. Now, how do you determine this? So all that you're really doing, let's say you've got 60 different variables, you're going to look at the two uh, uh, that are um, that have the most variation in them and these are the ones that you're going to plot, plot and that's how you compress the data. But then I said this was not linked necessarily to the quality. So what you would see is principal component analysis can be used but you have to be wary of the fact that you first need to understand the processes you're working with. So as an engineer, what you would always do, you would first determine the variables that are important in your processes. Yeah, so your critical design parameters. And this is where partial least squares so or PLS becomes much and more important. And particularly in, in the fourth year and the masters, we'll be talking about this. Because what partial least square does, it doesn't look at the most variation in the signal. But what it does do is which variables influence the quality of your product the most. And by defining those variables, you know what you need to control. So imagine you can, you can imagine that pH is very important. Change pH a little bit and the growth of the microorganisms is going to be very different. But it might be that another vari variable, uh, for instance the temperature, if this varies a lot, that this does not in influence the, uh, the quality of the final product. And all that this really does is rather than you have you can control 60 different things, it's to make it more manageable because we are working with software. You can't ask an engineer to go around and to write down 60 different values. You need to make sure that you have a couple of core values that you control to make sure that the quality of the product is consistent. And how this works, as I said, this will go into more detail when you actually get to the master. So the main difference between the two principal component analysis, you're just compressing data based on the variation you see in the signal in PLS, you're looking at what parameters actually influence the quality. Now, obviously, models are always a representation of reality. So it's not the same as, as humans where, and here you can see this example of the tree. We see a tree, we recognize that this is a tree every single time. But what you have to tell a model, or particularly when you start working with neural networks, is to have to train them at certain aspects. So you might train the model in the fact and saying like, this is a tree, a tree has green leaves and what happens then is when you know it becomes winter and the tree doesn't have leaves your computer wouldn't recognize it but we would or if the trees are on fire and this has happened before and then you know when you maybe start to extinguish things your model wouldn't recognize it as a tree because all of a sudden the color is very different so what you always need to be aware of is that the training of the model is very important and particularly, you can, can go even overboard with the training, which is also something you will see in a master. So when you start overtraining things, it becomes too specific. And then you don't kind of capture the essence of what it is anymore. So with modeling, you always have to think, first of all, how many data sets have I used to train this on? But when I've trained the model, when I've actually applied it to something else, which is in your normal data, you probably have a lot more variation than in your real data. Does it still work? Yeah, so a model is always just a part, it's not the reality, it's only part of what it is. So you always need to make sure that you are aware of that and be critical of the models that you're using. Uh, and within this module I've also incorporated some text and also some uh, chapters that you can read on artificial intelligence. And why it's important, so obviously it helps us to speed up processes, it makes it easier for us to process data. But likewise, we should also be very aware of the drawbacks that come with it. This is a very brief summary of this lecture. And as I said, there's, there's more uh, available to read, which uh, will give you some more details of the concept that we're talking about. So first of all, the difference between uh, physiological and inferential control. Why would you want to use inferential control? Simply because it's much easier. Why there's a need for modeling and bioreactors? And this is simply because these processes are very complex uh, and you can't control every single parameter, you can't. So what you're doing in this modeling is you are using appropriate models to compress your data to just the essence. So what are the key design parameters? If you're designing your reactor, if you're controlling the quality of the product, 
what are the key things you need to keep in mind and you obviously you try to keep this as low as possible without having too much influence on the quality of your final product.